We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. Governor DeSantis wanders into the midst of all of this with a anti-mob. Can you believe they're using the word mob as a as, as the other mob, not the mob that they are? But uh, an, an anti-mob legislation, which basically restricts civil liberties. You can't really protest that easily in Florida anymore. And if you decide to protest, people could drive their cars right into you just because you're blocking their road. Um, that's just one of the provisions of this new legislation, which is clearly designed to, I think, provoke violence in anything it doesn't seem to be like it's it's really designed to stop it i think it's basically designed to really provoke a reaction and that's why he's done it mm -hmm. now i know uh noel you've, you've got some pretty strong feelings about this i do not just driving into crowds which goes to my point of people on the right getting these big jacked up pickup trucks because right. you, you might need to roll over some antifa on your way back with the chicken wings to protect the country <laughs> protect the homeland right. exactly and i'll defer to andrew Six on pack and some chicken wings <laughs> exactly i had to roll over a couple and you know Antifa on the way home back from Pensacola. Also in that new bill is it's a third degree felony if you show up and they deem this thing unlawful and then you lose your right to vote. So I think hidden in there more yeah. in a more evil way, it's another attempt at voter suppression and it's suppressing the vote of the kind of people that they think might show up to protest police brutality. And you saw the cops you know, when he had this press conference yesterday, they looked no, like same. central casting. If I was like, hey, get me a bunch of no necked Southern racist looking like Bull Connor cops, all right? Because they had 20 of them on that stage. And the guy even made a comment. He said, and if you move to Florida and we got 100 people moving here a day, don't vote like an idiot like you did up north. Oh, absolutely. You know? He actually said those. Yeah. Actually, I had that clip yeah. somewhere. I might, I'm, if I find yeah. it, I'll play it in a bit. But absolutely. I mean, this was, this, I mean, talk about a heightening fear for something that isn't even happening. There are no protests happening, but they're, they've got to get the riot bill signed and they've got to get it passed just in case you know, those, that black threat comes along the way. And just in case they block your road and just in case they block the beach, then, you know, then we've got all the power we need to make sure we can run them over. It's it's just they are benefiting from this so much politically and it's so vulgar really yeah. there's no there's no other reason for them to be doing what they're doing yeah, yeah. and if you're asking me of yeah. course yeah. it's just it's like you said at the top of the show it's this division and people are becoming masters at exploiting it and DeSantis studied under Trump oh, and he's he Trump He's much more dangerous than Trump. Yeah. Trump's an idiot and he wants people to look at him when he walks in a room. I think Andrew said this on Twitter. DeSantis is Trump with a law degree. Oh, he's not <laughs> in, and he's evil and ambitious. He scares the hell out of me, to be quite yeah, honest with he, you. He's, and he's, you, he's, you were he's saying forward. that earlier as well. Or yeah, actually. he's yes, he's definitely the he's definitely the heir apparent for to Trump at least down in Florida, and uh, I bet a lot of people are looking at him as the yeah. uh, he, he's he's probably more likely to get that nod than Tom Cotton or a Hawley or these other guys, Ted yeah. Cruz, they're all, they're all still going to be there. They're vying Pompeo, but I think he's the one that, that, yeah, I think he's got it. Well, he's yeah. going to get it. And Terrifying. the Floridians are, they, there is a no tax state, right? So that's why people are, that's why New Yorkers are moving down there. Mm -hmm. Huge numbers of New Yorkers have left, are leaving right now because okay. of the legislature and yep. Cuomo are about to say to the very rich in New York City, you got to pay up. You know, the city's on its knees. Let's, oh. let's get you know, They're, they're going to try to tax them. And my friends down in Miami are like every single apartment sale right now is to a New Yorker. They are they, just. Did, did they know that he also passed there. a billion dollars of new taxation last night. DeSantis did in the middle of the night. He passed. Maybe a, not. Maybe they'll come running back. <laughs> so maybe they'll come back. It's interesting that a lot of New Yorkers have left New York. To, I don't want to segue there because I think I'm going to land up in a different conversation. Andrew, you're going to jump in and talk about DeSantis. Yeah, I, I think he's, as everyone accurately states, he's their rising star. He's the GOP's rising star, and you got to keep an eye out for him. you got to call him out, obviously, on a lot of the nonsense that he's pushing. I don't think there's enough attention out there focused on him, and like he's got such a great response to COVID. I don't believe that to be true. I think there are issues with reporting numbers in terms of people who have, you know, 
passed away in Florida. There's just a number of areas maybe to look at with him, and you just I don't really see the kind of media focus on those things as I did with others. Yeah, not yet in any event. Mm -hmm. Is it Indeed. actually legal to pass a law where you can say it's okay to run over people who are blocking no. the road? It can't be. No. I, I honestly see this as just political theater. I think it's going to mm -hmm. get, I, I can almost guarantee you it will be challenged and it will be struck down. It's illegal. It's unlawful. You're, you're turning human beings into felon machines, these trucks, and, and you can't legalize something like that while also violating a First Amendment right to assemble and to peacefully protest. And, and so holding I, people- so much wrong with that yeah, yeah. statute. I, I can't imagine it surviving you know, one day of serious judicial review. And the other but thing isn't was the, Florida isn't Florida the home state of the stand your ground? You can shoot anybody who comes to your door. That's true. And it is, but this is a bit different. You are using a truck as a battering ram because you gotta go get more beer and wings, as we were talking earlier. And you've got your Ram five fifty diesel powerhouse V twenty barreling down the block to freaking knock these people down like bowling pins. So I, I don't. It's a little bit different. Someone's coming onto yeah. your property. And you feel threatened, then, then, but it's still tough. Right? You can't just go around shooting people that come walking up to your door. I was just delivering the mail, man. You were very possible, aggressive right? with that envelope. But that's a Florida thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I even would stand your ground. There's still, it's still very difficult to get away with just blowing someone away for the sake of blowing someone away. Castle doctrine. We have a castle doctrine in New York State. Where if someone breaks into your house, man's house is his cat. Man, man's house is his castle. But you still have a duty, you know, under the castle doctrine to retreat and try to just diffuse, diffuse the situation before you have to start deploying deadly force, unless you're immediately uh, assailed with deadly force. So you know uh, that's really kind of away with that. Yeah, and that, that, that does break down on race as well. Surely that's only a thing that you can do if you're a white person, and it's not really something that black people could do in this country in any state. One of the things that struck me about the response today to the court case, you see, they were like talking about Kyle Rittenhouse. Remember Kyle Rittenhouse, who a few weeks after the initial the, this George Floyd killing went shot to two people, two people died, I think, and he shot them in like in front of cameras, in front of crowds, and basically was like. I, I don't I think he was arrested, but he was ultimately carried out of the scene. Like he was the victim somehow of, of this thing. And he had shot two people in cold blood with a weapon. And because he's white and a 17 year old, I guess you, I don't know, whatever it was at the time, somehow he was treated like, oh, it's okay. He was just reacting to all those, those dangerous black people out there. And meanwhile, George Floyd is, is dead under the, under the pressure of a, of a policeman's knee. It's the, there is such a race disparity in terms of what you're, you're saying there, Andrew, about white people can get away with in America and, and, black people can get away with believe it or not yeah i agree with that it's just there's so many there's so much evidence to that effect i think kyle rittenhouse actually shot white people believe it or not people that were not that it matters you know person is a person you, you blow them away you know, in that matter you're a violent felon and you need to answer for that but yeah ellie sees this kid walking around with his ar his mom just dropped him off like from school like with his little lunch bag or whatever with his backpack <laughs> and his books you know, to to the protest from illinois and he's walking around and, and then he gets himself into, into trouble and then he's in a position where he needs to wrongfully deploy his weapon and he blows someone's body part off i think initially it's just crazy it's why are we here you know i mean like why is stupid garbage like this happening <laughs> we should just blame uh, Ron DeSantis for everything. I think it'll be the, the way you know, it goes. Yeah. Now. It's, the same, it's the same type of vein. Yeah, it is yeah. very similar. And it's that, can I just make a quick point? It's back to that thing where somehow these weapons have become acceptable in, in our society. Now, I lived a half an hour from Sandy Hook. The mom who was the first victim of Sandy Hook, who was the mom of the shooter, bought her son that weapon, the right. same kind that Kyle Rittenhouse had and every other mass shooter has to bond with him. He was like special needs and had some issues and she wanted to bond with her son. So she thought it would be a good idea to buy him this weapon. And that's the new thing that's here in our society that would be like, when I, I was a troubled kid, if I was like, hey, I think I need an assault rifle now to help me out of these teen years where I'm acting out, my family would slap me upside the head. What are you, nuts? That's not happening. But Let's go fishing. Exactly, exactly. How about, yeah, we're gonna drop you off on an island outside of Maine and give you a fish hook on a match <laughs> and see if you come back. 
Like now it's like Andrew said, Kyle Rittenhouse's mom did drive him there with yeah. his gun and his survival kit. Oh, and he did shoot two people and blew off someone's hand and the cops handed him a bottle of water and thanked him for coming. He only got arrested the next day. Yeah. When no, he was like, oh, we're going to have to come and get you. You know, He was so, there to escort the police. He was basically helping them out doing yeah. whatever... Right. paramedic stuff they needed him to do, even though he was not a paramedic. Nina's got a, Nina's been on before and she's done this name and shame thing. I don't have as exciting a graphic look this time, but I'm excited about what we're going to do in terms of name and shame, because there was a good report uh, came out this week about the companies that are actually helping all these voter suppression laws come to life by supporting all the politicians, all the lawmakers in these set, in these state uh, houses to, to you know, run their political careers and, and by funding them. I mean, it's interesting who the two, the top 10 funders are of all these state uh, lawmakers who are passing all these voter suppression laws, which is a bit of a tangent, but it is obviously related to what we've been talking about. So Nina, I don't have the list. I'm going to pull it up quickly because I'm sure you don't have it in front of you. I, um, I'm looking at it. Oh, okay. Public Citizen is yeah. one of those great good government groups that does all this research. It's not my research, it's theirs. And oh. they released this report pointing out that contributions from corporations since 2015 have totaled $50 million to state legislators supporting voter suppression bills, including 2020, uh, sorry, including 22 million during the 2020 election cycle. The thing is that you gotta think about this. These corporations love to, they love to play the diversity game. They love to talk, talk the talk. But when it comes down to walking the walk with the money, they are not doing what they are, what they're pretending to yeah. be. So you're the Coke, starting the from- The Koch brothers are number 10. And then- Which is surprising, right? You would think the Koch brothers would be right up there because Cokes are behind Alec, the, yeah. uh, you know, the, 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 um, the cut, cookie cutter, right winger, state legislator uh, statute yeah. machine. But then farmer's insurance is number nine. Can't say much about that. BNSF rail. I don't even know who that is. Who's, who's BNSF rail? They transfer oil and stuff on railways. Well, that makes sense. There you uh, go. The Pfizer brought you, bring you your vaccines and they bring you your voter suppression laws, it appears, um, as does State Farm. And then in the bottom end of this, or well, the top end of this list, Walmart. That's not really that surprising, is it? That Walmart's going to be there. Maybe, maybe it should be, but they don't even pretend to be that uh, liberal on the outside. And uh, then there's United Health, Comcast, the owners of MSNBC, amongst many other things, also bring you voter suppression on the other side of their mouth. Yes, of their isn't that, that's a good and, point. And then oh, Altria, yeah. which is Altria's Altria, that's the Philip Morris company again. And then, and then number one in this list is AT&T. Go figure. Yeah, and these are they make these decisions based on they're not giving them the money because they want voter suppression. They're giving them the money because they want statutes that are friendly to probably their litigation, their their susceptibility to litigation or tax issues, or that's what they're giving these right wingers money for. But they happen to just also get crazy anti-abortion shit and everything else that goes along with and the gun stuff, everything else that goes along with supporting the re the red side of these state legislatures. Yeah, those well, are your- Don't we have to become uh, a little bit more disciplined about these things? It seems, it seems that everyone's just so easily on funding these Republicans for, and their policies suck, but I guess they, they avoid regulation, I guess, or they get lower taxes in theory. And that's what it matters. Do. They're just doing actuarial yeah. stuff when they yeah. look at this. It does. It's not about the community. It's not about society. It's about how much can we keep our bottom line from making our, our, our stockholders unhappy. And that's the problem with this, the, the system that we've got. That uh, and then they put they put diversity on as window dressing. You know, but it is good. They've certainly have stepped up with the Georgia stuff. Yeah. Even the fact that they talk about it is important. But but yeah, let's uh, let's put the uh, put the wallet where the mouth is and mm -hmm. stop pouring money into especially these state legislators, which are these state legislatures are, oh my God, they're just nests of corruption. I mean, I started in Springfield, but Albany. Ohio, and the things that are going on there, yeah, what they get Andy. away with, Tallahassee, oh man. Yeah. Oh yes, Matt Gates. Yeah, no one's telling us Matt. I'm week. sure you've done a whole show on him. I missed that, I'm sorry. It's but. three, it's three good episodes. <laughs> I'll send you the links, they're great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, these, these are, these, the state legislatures are in a real, they're, they're a, a hotbed of, of, of corruption, and yet they are the ones who are now gonna decide, potentially, 
who the next election is going to be won by because they've yeah. given themselves all these new authorities. Some of these crazy laws allow the legislatures actually to override what the voters have decided. The voters could decide, yeah, yeah, yeah we want to be Democrats. Everybody else. That's why they focus on them because they're purchasable. They're, yeah. they're, they're way more purchase, purchasable and for a lot less than your average senator, U.S. senator. It's a lot easier to go to this Columbus or Albany and get stuff mm -hmm. that you want. So was today a turning point? Did we feel America turn into the right direction or was it just it had to happen because it was obvious? No, I'll start with you. I, I think it was a bit of a watershed moment. I, th I feel like it was actually a bit of a turning point because precedent has been set now and hopefully a chapter has been closed. It's not, and I lose precedent loosely, I know I'm with it, but I'm just saying it's like w there was some redemption from Rodney King, from all these ar horrible big public cases we've seen in the past. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. Obviously, we have Ahmad Arbery's trial coming up. This stuff happens every day. We w they weren't even going to charge him a year ago. They listed it as a medical event on the right. Minneapolis police right. website. It was only public right. pressure that brought this case in the first place. But this case was like enough of this. We're sick of this. And everybody took to the streets. And the big difference between this case and cases in the past, if you watch Black Lives Matter in that movement, it was white folks out there in the streets this time. Oh, Barack Obama said that. It's, it's, they're shoulder to shoulder with you now. And that's going to change things, hopefully, and for the better. But I think it did change things. Andrew? Yeah. I, I think it's the beginning of something. I think we need momentum. I think we need to keep it up. I'm a big proponent of us, of everyone, with issues like this, and also especially with elections, just to keep it up. Stay involved. Vote in every election counts from dog catcher to POTUS. It does not matter. If we fall back, if we slide back into a Trumpian-type president, or we have more of these types of cases where people go free and the jurors are just not doing their job or, or you know, prosecutors aren't putting cases in front of grand juries. So they're not being pressured to do that. We can go back. It's all about how we want to make America better. Okay. How we want to move forward and become, like I always say, a more perfect union. All right. It's a never ending quest. It's never going to end as long as America is, exists. Nina? Well said, by the way, Andrew. Yeah, yeah that was good. Yes, I think it is a turning point. Absolutely. I think the BLM, the summer of protests was a turning point. As you said, whites, uh, people of all ages, colors were standing shoulder to shoulder against this. And I think that cops, um, with this him going down like that, honestly, what's going on in Minneapolis with the cops is unbelievable. Yeah. This, the, what they're doing to journalists is crazy it's it's insane the pictures that are coming out of there are uh, so i don't know if those cops are going to look at this and see that you know one of their fellow men is now handcuffed walked off the off the scene into the into a dungeon now that that could maybe make them think twice about how they behave towards people hopefully but i think it is a turning point it, it, it was a turning point as of last summer and it would have been a very bad turning point if he had been convict let go that would have been not good and so, yeah it's a turning point but things just move very slowly I, I i don't know i don't know whether this has an effect on police behavior because that's what it has to be but i think the cameras that them wearing cameras or people carrying cameras around has been a huge boon yeah. imagine what it was like when they didn't have cameras if this is what's going on with cameras imagine what was going on yeah absolutely i mean I think there's a real it. moment of truth that that we've been experiencing with all these cameras and, and with just the amount of visibility we now I mean, have into how these police stations, how these police you know, operations work. It's really remarkable point. that we can see all this stuff now. So it's that's a big deal. That's really hard to run away from the truth. I, I hope certainly that people change their behaviors, but I also wonder if we are you know, still need to be paying a bigger attention to these external forces that might be amplifying and setting us into these oppositional spaces that are very, very difficult for us to get out of in the long term. At the end of the day, we've got an election in just around the corner, and we're going to want to make sure that Americans feel like they can raise families in America, like that this is still a country that you can raise kids in. And I don't know if people feel like that so much when they see shootings every day and they see these court cases and the black people getting killed in, in all these places. We, we still need to create an environment that's ultimately, that is ultimately positive for people to raise their families. I'm not sure we're there yet. I want to make sure that we, we focus more on that going forward. Now, I see Glenn Kirshner just popped in here. And I don't know you've got to run. So mm -hmm. I might just flip you guys out. And then I was going to end the show, but we'll, we'll have a few minutes with Glenn because here he is. So okay. thanks, Nina. It's great to see you. Thanks very that's much for joining us. Where's your book out, Nina? Many weeks yet too for for you to help me 
uh, happy, promote it. Happy to promote it all the time. It's so good. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Nina. you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Just like that, Nina becomes Glenn Kirshner. Hi, Glenn. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Hey, guys. I'm really good. Hey. Uh, hey Noel, hey. Andrew. And thanks. I We're do. almost about to wrap up, but you're here. So how awesome is it for you to spend some time with us uh, tonight? I know you're busy. Uh, give us your quick takeaway. This was, uh, we were just saying, is this a watershed moment or, or is this just a, a start of something that we need to still get to? Yeah, I hope that this gets justice trending. And I don't mean trending on social media. If we can actually, and, and I think we have a chance. And, and I'll talk about why in a minute, but if we could get justice trending in our police departments, in our prosecutors' offices, in our criminal justice system, in our legislatures, in our schools, in our communities, I think we have a chance, maybe a chance that we haven't really had before. I look at a parallel between what I saw in the George Floyd murder prosecution, which I have to say was expertly tried, okay? I can tell you, I tried more than 50 murder cases in the courts of Washington, D.C., including murder-driven RICO cases. I never tried a case as expertly as I just saw that prosecution team try that case. The parallel I see is between the police leadership of the Minneapolis Police Department getting on the stand and breaking the back of one of their own because they were wrong. I am still inspired by Chief Arredondo. Mm. He stood up and in a full-throated way, he said, what Derek Chauvin did was wrong. It was excessive. It was unreasonable and it was deadly force. And he wasn't the only one from the Minneapolis Police Department testifying like that. That's and then the difference. just... I was just on with Joy Reid and I got to sit and listen to J President Biden's comments as we were waiting to come back to the panel. And he said, and I quote, it's time to take head on the racial disparities that exist in policing mm. in a full throated way. That's where I see the parallel, because what it might take to really get rid of the bad cops is the good cops mobilizing because mm, yeah. the bad cops make the good cops it makes their job so much harder yeah. and i think chief arredondo and other like, like lieutenant zimmerman the senior most member of the minneapolis police department who testified against chauvin they took the stand and they gave the jury permission because jurors are like everyday people they'll look at a use of force video and they'll say, man, that looks wrong. That looks criminal. That looks like murder. It looks like an execution. But I don't know anything about police procedure. I don't know how use of force works. When good officers come in and say, let us tell you how use of force works. It's not what Derek Chauvin mm. did. That was criminal. That may be what it takes. That together with a president of the United States who in a full-throated way says we have racial disparity in policing and it needs to be addressed. Compare that to what Trump said when he was talking to the chiefs of police. He said, don't be so gentle when you put them in the cruiser. Bang your head against the door jam. Fortunately, gone are those days. But if we now have leadership in our police departments, in the executive branch, in our legislatures that are willing to say, we're going to seize the moment and we're going to get justice trending. And now I am supposed to do Zerlina because I'm getting called. It's okay. Up. Go do it. Go do it. For, you, you did a great job Dude, with us. Thank you so much. For awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys. I'm sorry. Bravo. Bravo. So, that's no, five minute that appearance. We've ever had on narrative. Well done. <laughs> Thanks very much, Glenn. The man is in demand, but uh, you can that see why awesome. he, he knows his, uh, he knows his way around it. What do you say? What do you, when you do a, a closing statement? I think, I think what Glenn said was phenomenal. I think he's right about yeah. the, that one thing that was so specifically different about this case was that the police came, you know, took the stand and they said themselves, they were critical of their guy. And that I don't recall in many other cases. Uh, that's certainly, Andrew, do you recall anything like that in any of the cases you've uh, no, the civil rights claims that I litigate and, and prosecute for people who are victims of police brutality or false arrest or malicious prosecution, anything like that, any rights violations, I have to hire an expert, which is usually a former police officer to right. testify on my behalf because you've got to counter 
and demonstrate, because you have the burden of proof as the plaintiff, as prosecutors have the burden of proof in a criminal prosecution, you have to demonstrate what happened, what was wrong, where did they mm -hmm. violate uh, use of force guidelines, use of force is on a continu con continuum, and you constantly have to readjust, which clearly Derek Chauvin did not do. You, yeah. you use the, the amount of force reasonable and necessary to overcome any force that you're facing. And again, you have Derek Chauvin putting his knee on uh, George Floyd's neck while he's unconscious. And so clearly that's an excessive use of force, which causally led to his death. So right. that's, yeah, so that's, that's what makes a huge difference having the police yeah. actually speak up. And I noticed in the case in Brooklyn Center, the, the police officer who shot that kid the last week, uh, right. she resigned immediately. She accepted the fact that she had just made a stupid mistake or made whatever. She, she walked off the job. She felt it was better for the police force in general that she wasn't there it felt to me like an attempt at least to not to not try hide behind the badge or try to yeah, hide behind the, the, the yeah, and, yeah. And, and responsibility for yeah. her you know egregious act yeah exactly which is what you want from police officers i guess then it is watershed we'll call it watershed for all of that gosh it's heartbreaking to see the family but they were so overjoyed today at justice it's remarkable what justice can do for you it that is. moment of having a jury stand up and say, this man is guilty. This man is guilty of killing your son and your brother. And this is exactly what he, this is what he deserves. This is what he needs to happen. That, that is the most cathartic, well, even it's cathartic, it's probably not even the right word, but it's just the most important closure for people to have mm -hmm. at the end of this traumatic and epic journey that this family has been through for them to actually have this moment of, okay, we can breathe now. We've done our work for George. I think that's why they have scales in justice, right? Is because yeah. you're trying to balance it out. And I think right. as a nation, we learned today, it feels good to do the right thing. It feels good to not have a conflicted thing that you have to make excuses for. You know, mm -hmm. setting, it, setting the record right is a new chapter. And I think people will find that it feels good. And Glenn said, cops are coming forward now in a way they have before and that's going to make all the difference it, it really will yeah 100 percent one hit it right on the head narrative is funded by viewers like you support our independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative <laughs>